I, um, I, when I got to New York, you know, I wasn't interested in advertising anymore. I was interested in theater. Because theater is one of the other ways, you know, they were, when this whole deal of making things that were not there started, they, way back in the Paleolithic period, you could imagine a man walking, or something that was almost a man, walking inside the cave and looking in the cracks of that cave, something that made, me, made him think of something else. Before we learn a language, we have to understand before we speak. So that goes with any language. Therefore, with representations, that probably the same thing happened. He saw in the cracks something that looked like a bison or a boar. Not only any boar. He remembered a boar that he had killed in the company of friends. He remembered, he remembered the hunt. He remembered the taste of the animal and the party that followed the, the hunt. And then he looked at it again, and he realized that there was just a crack in a wall. Then he picked, a blunt, he picked up a blunt instrument and went there and carved the missing eye in that accidental design. That man was the first artist. You know, he, not only he was the first artist, he invented a novel form. He invented a novel form of communication. He was able to relate to something that was not there, that happened before. Soon he realized that he, not only he could see that, but he could also show that to other people. And then representation was invented. You know, everything else that rules our world today, economy, religion, politics, are based on the fact that we, we let ourselves be fooled momentarily for something that's not there. And this always started the moment somebody carved the missing eye in that accidental form. You know, since the, they, he started, he showed that to his tribesmen, his friends thought of those drawing, the, the drawing as sacred, and they thought that he was a priest of some sort. The thing is, whenever people got tired of looking at the cracks, the artist was forced to go there and paint and color it and paint it a little bit more on top of it. And this has been the story, has been the story of representation since its invention. Is this continuous uh, run, uh, 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 comp uh, it's like a cynicism running from technology, you know? Every time somebody gets tired of looking at something, somebody has to go there and fool make something that's a little bit more effective and full in the eye. I uh, started becoming an artist. It's another story. I, I, I used to date uh, a, a woman who was an artist, and she went to Yale. And she thought of, she, I was never, never did in university, so she thought that I would, didn't know anything about art. And I think I, she, she, every time I go to the museum, she had very strong opinions about everything. And every time I said something, she said, oh, you don't know anything. And I think I became an artist out of spite. <laughs> but uh, I went, I rented a studio in, um, in, in the Bronx, and I used to go there. I used to be a weekend artist. And only the, on the weekends, I worked the whole day, the whole week, and then on the weekends, I could go there and do my art. Uh, today is the same thing. I do all these stupid things the whole week. Only the weekends, I can make what I want to do. Uh, but it, I remember I painted the whole room white, I found a really modern, nice chair in the, in the, bed, in the garbage, and I put the chair there, and I, I sat, and I was, uh, now I'm going to make some art. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. I was waiting for art to come, <laughs> you know? And it was then like this, you know, sort of pursuing this invisible muse. 30 years later, you know, you realize that you never met the broad, and, you know, you still have to make art. But what... Uh, what, are this, what is this art? You know, is this something? And I realized that it's, it is not really. It's a way of filtering uh, the, everything that happens to you. I teach students, and they always have this thing about expressing themselves. When they're like expressing themselves when they're 16, it's only you, you do that through pimples, you know. I mean, it's not really, you have to live a little bit. You have to be, and then I think uh, uh, I started to, to think that maybe I could use things that came from before, my experiences with advertising. And then I started to use everything that had happened in my life previous to that moment. So I kept thinking of advertising something magical because you give identities to powders, to liquids, to gels. You give them color. You give them shape. You get something that is, you know, some liquid. You just give them, like, a color blue. 
light blue and then you make put it in the shape or pink and put it in the shape of a little woman which because it's good for your hands or you put something in the shape of a gun make it look red because it's tough for mosquitoes so i kept thinking of what if the person who makes the pitch you know their sales pitch is also the person who makes the object what kind of object is that that would produce so my first object my first act was is this thing going while i'm talking is it Wait, I'm not doing anything. Okay. I didn't do that. It was a kid who did it. Uh, my first objects were objects with sort of identity problems. This is a nail fetish, you know, something that was found in Africa in the 19th century. This is a, an origami maker, but he's made out of a single sheet, including the origami that's in his hand. The clown school, a remnant of a race of entertainers. They roam through South America, the Paleolithic, the Ashanti joystick. This is for Atari. The rocking podium. For, a, for like in the age of doping, you know, that could be. The pre Columbian coffee maker. The bonsai table. The entire Encyclopedia Britannica in a single volume for tra <laughs> travel purposes. And the half tombstone for people who are not dead yet. <laughs> you know, one thing happened is like when you make objects and you bring them to the gallery, the gallery hires a guy to photograph the object. And the day they brought the guy to photograph the object was the happiest date for the object, in my opinion. Because... Uh, the objects were there, and this guy named, I, named, I remember his name. It was Peter Muscato. He came with two assistants, lights, and it was the apotheosis of the object. You know, and, to, and the people were going around, and I was like, wow, the ob object was made for this. And he made these huge, beautiful uh, chromes. They were glossy and perfectly lit. And I looked at it, and I thought, something is wrong. And I looked at them for a long, long time until I decided to solve the riddle, doing the thing that I do. I tried to do that myself. So I went to the wrong place, bought the wrong camera, loaded it with the wrong film, lit it with the wrong light, and photographed it, and took it to the wrong one-hour photo to see the results. And they were right. But what made the pictures right, my pictures right, and the picture of the professional photographer wrong? And I look at them for a long time until I found the answer. When a creative person or an artist imagines an object, he imagines it in his head, in his visual field, right? And because I'm a grown-up, children probably, and also autistics, uh, autists, they have a, 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 more, a, a great facility to rotate objects inside their mind than most people do. So when the artist or the normal person Imagines an object, imagine it from a specific vantage point. And the artist makes the object out of clay, wood, or whatever. And when the object is in the gallery, the artist goes around the object. And when he finds the specific vantage point that he had imagined the object before he made the object, the artist is happy. The professional photographer had no way to find out where I had seen the object from, but I had. And I started envisioning this full circle that brings the object to the back to the state that's very similar to where I started. And I kept thinking about all this relationship with the image inside your brain, trying to find out what it was made of. And the first thing I went back to was like, like the crack on the wall that I was talking about. What are images accidental representation? Why do we relate to them? You know, and we look at places like in, in clouds, for instance. You know? I have a five-year-old daughter. And whenever we look at clouds, I keep tell, telling her that every single one of them looks like a seal. Until she goes like, yes, they do, you know. <laughs> it's me, I know. But um, it's, a, it, you know, the shapes, what, the, what I learned from this, it's just like, a, a, it's, a, it's what the uh, J.T. Mischel calls uh, multi-stable images, you know, like the Necker Cube and the Duck Rabbit, and, is that, we can only think of a shape or a form at a time. Even if you, when you look at this, you see a man rowing a boat, 
a cloud and cotton. But when you see cotton, you lose the, the main row in the boat and you, lo you lose the cloud. When you think cloud, you lose the main row in the boat and cotton. <laughs> and, uh, and so on. That's the bad thing because, you know, we, are, we, need, we have this thing that co that's called attention that makes us, you know, see one thing at a time. It's like a, 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 like a, a, a bottleneck. But also that thing is actually is what makes us be able to actually hold conversation, talk to people like I'm doing right now. And the good thing is that we can choose what we see. So you can, at any time, you can see whatever you want to see. So that creates a really interesting split that separates the material and the representation. And playing with that as being like uh, what I do for the last 25 years. I realized why people go to museums and observing the way, sitting on a museum, looking at the way they come to see paintings, I learned a lot about what I was trying to do with the billboards way back. You know, how you approach and why William, uh, James Jerome Gibson talked about the whole body as a perceptual device. So it's a funny thing. You go to museums, you never notice that, but you go, everybody goes towards a painting and they walk towards it and they all stop in the same spot, as if there was tape on the floor. And why they stop there? They don't stop here, but they stop there. And they look at the painting, they stop there, because that's the place where they can see the, the, their visual field fits comfortably inside the frame of the painting. Let's say it's a painting. So they can go inside the painting, leave in the wonderful landscape that's in the painting, but they know that if they do this, they're in, back in the museum, safe. And not only that, they, don't, no, they go a little bit farther, they a little bit closer, and then they do this. <laughs> what are they doing? They actually doing the most important thing in any art form, in the perception, the experience of any art form. When they get close, they see material. They see this mundane thing where all the, all the technology, everything that's, all that's the creative emerged from. And when they get farther, they see the painting, something idealized, something that's made by the mind. And when they go back, they see matter. When they go far back, they, they see mind. And it's art, the experience of art is not in the perception of matter or in the perception of representation. The experience of art it's exactly in the point where you cross the threshold, where for a small moment, you feel that one thing transforms into something else. It's just like that second before a first kiss, or the moment the basketball, basketballer threw the ball and he hasn't reached the rim yet. It is magical, you know, because you feel, this, that is, I, I see the artwork as this thin membrane that separates the world of matter from the world of mind. And I see the responsibility of the artist to sort of polish this surface in a way that you can almost see that you can get through it. It is an exercise that in, when you talk about creativity, I, don't, I, I keep thinking that it's, it's the exercise of, of imagining different forms for this relationship. And, you know, and in photography, you can do so many things. Um, I'm going to jump... I'm controlling this, or I'm controlling the guy who's controlling this. Thing. 